Hello everyone, my name is James Marriott and today, book. I think I'm getting to the point where I've read more books for my YouTube channel than I have for any other reason. In fact, the last time I read a book for any other reason, I was probably the same age as today's author, Charlie D'Amelio. Today, we will be answering the question, can a TikTok star made famous for 10 to 20 second bites flourish in a 183 page format? Or will this work be to our literary taste buds as snails were to Dixie's tongue? <laughs> First of all, I want to establish what kind of genre this book is in. I bought this thinking it would be an autobiography, which, you know, would be, oh, instant content for me. A TikTok star who hasn't been famous for longer than two years, writing an autobiography about her extensive 16 years of life. The video would write itself, quite frankly. But this book doesn't claim to be an autobiography, rather a guide to Charlie D'Amelio's life. I'm intrigued by this because it sounds like a how-to or even an instructional manual. We will program you into the next TikTok dance superstar. At 16, Charlie has more than 100 million followers on tick tock i'm sure that's just an autocorrecting error as charlie surely knows by now that it's tick tock and not tick tock she is a tick tocker after all not a tick Talker. And Charlie definitely did write this book herself. Of course she did. Why would they lie about that? No one would ever lie to me, would they? Why would you lie to me? Despite the fact that Charlie has well over 100 million followers over all of her social media platforms, they do remind you to uh, follow Charlie D'Amelio online. As if anyone who's forked out the money to buy this book doesn't already follow Charlie on all platforms. Wait, um... Yeah, fair enough. This is her exclusive journal where she tells all about her early childhood. See, that's the issue really, isn't it? She can't talk about her childhood in general because she's not out of it yet. It's almost as if you should only write an autobiography when you can put something within the pages. My early childhood. I watched a lot of Thomas the Tank Engine and well, that's, that's about it to be honest. I haven't really lived yet. We'll keep you updated, boss man. She'll also inform us of why IRL friends are important too. Sorry, this might be a generational issue I have. Expect a lot of these over the next few years, by the way. I'm aging far too quickly. What does the two mean here? Have people just flat out forgotten that IRL friends were there first? You know, back in my day, we just referred to IRL friends as, um, friends. Like actual physical friends. That being said, the people I've met online on average have been vastly superior, so bless up modernity. The first red flag I got about this book was its description of an interactive journal. I swear to God, if I have to partake in a quiz or draw something to progress the narrative, then I'm going to be requesting a refund. Now we've established that this isn't an autobiography for good reason, but once you approach a creator with the prospect of making a book about their life and they make it explicitly clear that they haven't really had one yet, it begs the question, well, what now? I've got a poetry journal, maybe we we should just- No. But I like my poetry, I'm good at po- Stop that. Okay, no one needs to read that. There are 10 parts in this book, which means an average of 18 pages per part with three pages to spare. When you read the titles for the different parts of the book, it actually becomes quite feasible that they were able to fill this thing with literary content, but that is simply not the case. And with that being said, before we get into these chapters, you should really subscribe. I put myself through so much for these videos. I read. Imagine actually reading something. If you enjoy my opinions, I have so many more opinions on books. Just type in Bad Book Club, watch every single one. Let's get right into a book made for kids. Part one is all about childhood, which is one of the main selling points of this book. This section lasts a whopping 20 pages, but I counted and there's only 12 paragraphs of content. And that's me being optimistic, okay? I've counted my birthday is on May 1st as a paragraph because it's technically informative. The first paragraph is about Charlie's introduction to dance. Her whole life revolved around dance according to the book. Apparently she danced 48 hours per week from the time she was five. That's fucking ridiculous. Some of you Americans are built differently. Wait, let me rephrase that. Some of you American parents are built differently. Stop trying to live your dreams vicariously through your kids. She tells an embarrassing story about her first performance. She couldn't move because her sunglasses were stuck to her snowman costume. I feel like we have to address this costume logically. What right does a snowman have to wear sunglasses? It's a bit stupid if you ask me. Stop caring about the UV rays, my guy. You're about to fucking die. Then a whole extra page is filled up by a fill it in yourself section. What's your first embarrassing or hilarious memory. You know, my issue with this section is I simply did not know which adjective to choose. I've been given far too many options for such a short space to fill in my response. Can I get some more paper, please? Now, straight away, this is reminding me a lot of the Jojo Siwa book I read last year. Go and watch that video after you've watched this one. There's obviously a lot of focus on her time at Dance Mums and her love for dancing in general. But one thing that this book can boast that Jojo Siwa's most definitely could not is they have found a way 
to put TikTok dances in books. Honestly, this is a bit of a game changer. It's phenomenal. I haven't even done the TikTok dance yet because I've been waiting for this moment. This is uh, my raw reaction. Oh my God, she's by Jehovah. There we go, boys. That is the highlight. I practically lived at the dance studio as a kid, but I did it because it was fun. Or so my parents told me anyway. Sorry, I'll avoid this topic from now on, but I just feel like kids don't actively choose to do something, let alone live at a dance studio. When I was a kid, I did rugby because it was fun until I realized that it's it's not fun. Imagine running around a field, getting beaten up just to come home to a dirt infested bar. But yeah, mum, I enjoyed that. Thanks for taking me every week. Definitely worth it. There are definitely some interesting details about Charlie from her early childhood. For example, on page seven, there's a rather pleasant story about a penguin. It still comes off as incredibly vague though. There's this section called Real Talk, where after writing paragraphs about her love for dance, she writes, I can imagine dancing for the rest of my life, hopefully as a career, but definitely just for fun. What is so real? about that in comparison to everything else she's written. It would make a lot more sense for real talk if she just went, you know what? I actually fucking hate dancing. Someone told me to do the woe the other day. What is a fucking woe? There's then this incredibly detailed two page section about Dixie. It's quite hefty, but I'm gonna read it all right now. I'm so lucky to have my big sister Dixie in my life. We've been through so much together and I really can't imagine being the person I am today without her. That's it. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot going on there. We've just been through so much together. There's this one time that our personal chef cooked us snails. <laughs> I'm going to have to deduct one of his mission stars. My favorite Halloween costumes so far have been Judge Judy, a candy corn, and the girl from the ring. I know, that went from zero to 100 pretty quickly, didn't it? So last Halloween I was a piece of candy, and now I'm a soul eating demon. That's what social media does to you folks, be warned. Part two is all about friendship, something that I've never heard of, so I was very intrigued to learn about it. I did get warning signs after reading the first few lines because she talks a lot about retaining the friendship she had before fame, followed by a picture of her with a uh, James Charles, and then, um, more celebrities. But there's actually some decent advice in this section about ways to break the ice or how you may not have the same friendships that you expected to have throughout your life. She does, however, lose some relatability points when she talks about the holidays she has with her friends. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who's not in a very well-off family. Your single mother has just spent half a day's wages on this book and she starts detailing how the Bahamas is her favorite holiday destination. It would probably be mine too if I was stonked out. This isn't even a one-time thing. She used to go there when she was little. That's a rolling contract, my friends. Section three is all about fashion, something I would consider myself an expert of. Today, my friends, I am wearing black. After spending one paragraph talking about her style, she then asked the reader to describe their style. She actually dedicates more space to you than she does to herself. Pretty selfless, if you ask me. Hold on, forget what I was saying about the Bahamas. When I was invited by Prada to Milan Fashion Week. So tell me a bit about your style. Huh? Well, that's gross. Now, moving on. The fashion world are kind of, you know, taking me in as one of their own. Prada Fashion Week. If I'm lucky, I get invited to a gaming festival in Scotland. And even then, they fly me out from Luton. It's a disgrace. I couldn't believe it when I first received my invitation. I'm just the girl who wears sweatshirts and leggings and dances for fun. If I'm being honest, Charlie, the fact you do it for fun is probably not the reason they've invited you. Otherwise, it would seem more like a make-a-wish. You don't just dance for fun. You dance for fun for hundreds of millions of people. That's probably where they make the money back. Section four is all about growing up and it's very unexpectedly philosophical. It starts off with a description about how she's changed as she's gotten older, which is very rudimentary. She's gotten more confident, more open. She's had more experiences. But then we hit what I like to call Plato's blunt. Life doesn't often work out the way you plan. Be flexible and open to change. It's okay to be different. The last one runs into a few canonical issues. Don't feel like you have to do the same things as everyone else, but also it is okay to fix. In, if that feels right to you. What's the right way, Charlie? I need answers. Hey, you, reader. Do this, but don't. But you can. Does that mean you should? You shouldn't, but you will. I've always believed that in order to figure out what you like and who you want to be, you have to try everything once. I agree with this. The thing that really awakened me to who I want to be was crack. That and a uh, heroin. You know, try everything once. I mean, arson was a life changer for me. In this chapter, there is a large chunk dedicated to mental health, which is unironically great to see. Obviously the target audience for this book is very young, but it's important to address mental health as soon as possible. It also comes as a stark reminder that a lot of influencers suffer from serious mental health consequences. I am one of many people in this space, including Charlie, that has regular therapy. I often feel like what we gain in virtual popularity, we lose in physical sanity. So next time you're thinking of leaving some hateful comment on an influencer's post, just direct that negativity towards my channel. Leave any kind of mean comment you want. Just hit that subscribe button before you do it. I don't suffer for nothing. What can I say? And in a very fitting matter, right after addressing mental health, we go to a chapter about social media. Perhaps the single most mentally 
slightly detrimental thing out there. This part focuses more on advice for any possible future creators out there. I feel like this is a real selling point for a lot of YouTuber books. How do you do it? Please, I want to be just like you. Let me imbibe your soul. I have two things to say on this matter. If you've bought this book for that reason, you're probably not going to be the next TikTok star. I don't think there is a single person who's asked me the question, how do I become a YouTuber like you? Who's then actually become a YouTuber. The point is you don't need to buy a YouTuber or TikToker book to get actual advice. Just look it up and be ready to do it for free for a very long time. That's the recipe. Second of all, I don't think people really realize what it is that they want. I spent a lot of my childhood thinking that I wanted to be famous, for example. I didn't care if I was going to be an actor, a musician, a director, or a YouTuber. I just wanted to have numbers on the internet because social media conditioned me into feeling happier the more likes I got on a post. That led me to believe that the more numbers I had, the further I got into the millions, the happier I would feel. Completely baseless. It is all meaningless. And once you have the perspective of someone that has a few numbers on the internet, you realize that you're no different from the person you were before fame. But for the sake of this video, we will be going through the tips. Be spontaneous, be comfortable. As someone who suffers from anxiety, these two things cannot coexist, I'm afraid. Also, spontaneous has never really worked out for me. It leads to breakdowns like a this. Just post what you like, not simply to gain a following. Agree. Don't post anything that will put other people down in the slightest. Wow, I also agree with that one. Definitely would never do that. I've never done that. <laughs> These tips aren't bad. They just feel very cookie cutter though. Just have fun. Be yourself and sell so your life to the algorithm. Oh Lord, give me you. The rest of the social media section seems to lack structure. People think they know me and then boom. Sounding a little like ISIS there, Charlie. I do something they weren't expecting. Oh my God, what's that, Charlie? Do you finish off the renegade? But whoa, they weren't expecting that one. Let's bring back the nene. I'm getting too old for this. In chapter six, we take a break from social media and talk about Charlie's me time. This is a fantastic section for the people who are interested in what Charlie likes. Uh, there's dancing, um, making dance videos and dancing, I guess. Oh wait, there's more. Chicken nuggets. There's a whole two pages dedicated to chicken nuggets. They look like almonds. The me time section is only 10 pages long. So this is one fifth of it. One fifth of Charlie D'Amelio's personality is chicken and nuggets and quite frankly I never realized we were so similar. Part seven is all about family and quite frankly that triggers me because I could write a whole fucking odyssey about family and it wouldn't be a happy experience. This is just anything you'd expect from an American influencer family. We're so happy. We love each other so much. My British audience out there, isn't it a bit weird how tight-knit families are outside of the UK? Come on, please tell me this isn't just a me thing. I don't think there is a single British family that can go a day without arguing. We just seem to hate people. Charlie even goes as far as featuring her grandma grandparents in this book. They are the most stereotypical looking grandparents I've ever seen. One of them is literally called Mama. I can literally smell the Yankee candles. The next chapter is about relationships. And this is a point where once again, I recognize that this book is probably not made for me. But clearly little Huddy was too busy trying to revive pop punk to be featured in this book. In this section, she talks a lot about leaving toxic relationships behind you, but she's 16 years old. How the fuck has she had multiple toxic relationships at 16? Is she living life on three times speed? That being said, she does somewhat revert to a child where she dedicates her uh, two pages to ice cream. Her favorite ice cream flavors are vanilla. You know what though, that actually, that is toxic. Part nine is about being in the public eye. She talks about her public nervousness, how she doesn't know how she got to where she is right now, why she struggles at time with mean comments. It's then just followed by all of the shows she's been on. Jimmy Fallon, huh? You heard of him? Kelly Ryan? Okay, no, no one's heard of Kelly Ryan actually. I didn't want to think that these were all flexes, but then she says that she can sing her ABCs backwards. Jimmy Fallon was one thing, okay, Charlie. Do you want me to fucking hate myself? I don't think I could even get past the tea. That being said, I always have been a coffee man. Someone please kill me. Someone please do and it. And then in part 10, giving back, she talks about spreading positive vibes. She's part of a UNICEF anti-bullying campaign, which is fantastic. She did also say, however, that she wants to fight for animal rights. Hasn't ended well for TikTokers so far, so maybe avoid that one. And then the book ends with an acknowledgement for all of the people that have made it possible. I think between three and four writers are credited, so they've written about a paragraph each here. That's quite a impressive. On a real one though, there are times in this book where I felt as if you could replace Charlie and Emilio with Jojo and Siwa and you'd have a book which I've already reviewed in this series. Seriously, go back and watch that video. These are carbon copies of one another. I think that's my issue with this book. I know it wasn't intended for me and if it did intellectually level up, it would lose its intended audience. But it's just the same thing all over again. We get it. You like to die.
chance. The way that some pages are dedicated to such irrelevant things to fill out the book. Other than the chicken nugget page, okay, that is important within the Charlie D'Amelio canon. I don't think a Charlie D'Amelio fan will get much from this that they didn't already know. It covers the same spiel that other influencers spout. Just be yourself, have fun, don't bully people. There isn't much in terms of actual unknown Charlie D'Amelio content. On page 93, she even dodges the what's your favorite color question. I have a hard time picking my favorite color because I don't want any of the other colors to feel bad. They are inanimate pigmentations, Charlie. I doubt they'll be chatting shit about you on twitter.com anytime soon. So I don't think I'll be buying this book for my little sister because I don't have a little sister. And yeah, whoo, it's gone. If there are any YouTuber books or films that you want me to read or watch, then do let me know in the comment section down below. If we get 10,000 comments, I'll make a video about Dixie D'Amelio's music. I've been James Marriott. Subscribe.